Well, under the general heading of the oration of the Emperor Julian, we want to make a little study of the religions of the world and there's very strongly feminine emphasis and in bringing in certain examples which will indicate clearly that the original revelations of most faiths were not primarily a masculine revelation. This has developed gradually over a series of ages by various causes which are gradually being changed. The probabilities are that among the most ancient peoples uh, to recognize the priority of the feminine principle was, were on this continent. Most of the Indians along the East Seaboard who belonged to the Great League of the Iroquois were very strongly overshadowed by the feminine principle. The uh, women of the tribes elected all of the officials and the men had no vote. And having no vote, the government went along very pleasantly. <laughs> the uh, women elected the senators. The men did not vote. The senators, in turn, carried out <coughs> the legislations of the tribes. But there was another interesting point, which I think has considerable political influence in our modern time, and that is that the political representatives of the various tribes were not permitted by law to have a ballot on their own tribe. When the Congress, get, when the Congress gathered, each uh, senator could vote on anything that did not concern his own tribe. The others had to vote that so that there was very little opportunity of working up a strong lobby. In fact, there never was any trace of one. Also another interesting point in connection with this uh, was that the uh, dealings political were very gentle. It was against the law to argue in the, in the tent where, or TB where the council was held. Everyone had to treat every other delegate, delegate with courtesy, patience, and honor. It was a very interesting situation, a very matriarchal culture, and it has been expressed by a number of modern observers that if the colonists had come 50 years later, they could not have dominated America. It was just one of those things destined by fate but it was definite and evident evidence that there was a strong matriarchal culture on our own hemisphere. In other parts of the world, we see similar peculiar situations arising in the development of religious uh, beliefs. In e almost all religions, there was at least one prominent feminine divinity. Very often, she was the most important of all. In the ancient Greek and Roman Empire, Athena, or Minerva, goddess of wisdom, of truth, and of law, was the presiding spirit. In another case, for instance, of course, in the Nordic and Gothic rites, Brunhilde, the daughter of Odin, was the mind maiden of the law was the one that was given the authority to discriminate between the levels of justice and also to select the heroes who were to have a special place in the afterlife. This goes on and on from one group to another and we find practically no evidence anywhere of lack of this consideration. In Egypt, of course, Isis was the mother of mysteries. She presided completely over the esoteric arts and sciences of Egypt. She was the one who was called upon under all conditions for the highest aspects of learning, understanding, and at Thais, on her statue, it was stated that she was the mother of the sun, S-U-N. This is another peculiar situation because all through the rites and mysteries, 
the feminine principle has been associated with and is identical with the mystical religions. The esoteric arts, alchemy, and those types of mysticism are all feminine dominated in their beginnings and developments. The transmutation of life was left to be a part of the feminine contribution to existence. Therefore, it's not unusual or unreasonable that we should explore some of the beliefs and doctrines relating to this subject. I think we may begin, of course, with the Emperor Julian. His great essays, in honor of celebrating the mother of the gods, is a tremendous document, but very subtle. Julian was not a great Platonist, but he was devoted to the works of Pro Proclus, the Platonic successor, and had intended to devote his life to study. But being raised suddenly to the purple by situations beyond his control, he had to divide his attention between the duties of state and the advancement of his philosophic life. He had very little time to do this as he only survived two years on, under the role of emperor. He then was killed in a battle in Persia where he was defending the outlying areas of the, of the, of the uh, Roman Empire. So Julian settled down very quietly to study Platonic mysticism, something that was perhaps best expressed through Proclus and uh, Plotinus. Uh, the uh, mysticism of Plato was a strange and rather intriguing subject about which very little is known and very much less is discussed. It is a part of a doctrine that Plato developed himself in which he pointed out that all forms of knowledge must lead back to the source of knowledge, whether this source of knowledge is in the individual or in the universe. All knowledge must ascend to its source or cause, and its source or cause is a mystical divinity. Uh, Plato was completely convinced that all intellection is futile unless it en enlifts the soul to, to communion with the mystery of its own inner existence. Julian tells us, for example, that the mother of the gods was called night. Now, this is a very peculiar thing to think of, but perhaps it is interesting to realize that according to uh, Julian's interpretation of Plato. Night was the beginning of everything. In the beginning was darkness. And darkness was not emptiness. Darkness was not despair. Darkness was a totality of an unman unmanifested reality. Night was rest. It was peace. Night was the time when the illusions of the outer life are more or less suspended. Night is the time when the soul has for a time dominion over both the mind and the body. And the soul, according to Julian, was the mother of the gods. The soul then becomes tremendously important, not only in Platonic mysticism, but in all those branches which more or less sprang from this root. The mother of the gods, then, being universal soul, the absolute intelligible, that which is, whether known or not known, that which is above and beyond the mind, that which can be reached by the mind only by an extension of itself into mysticism. The mother of the gods, therefore, represents the totality of the divine plan. It is the mother that brought forth the son. It is the mother that brought forth the orders and hierarchies of deities, divinities, and subdivinities. All these were produced out of the darkness of the great primordial mystery, the mystery of absolute soul power. Now, in practical thinking, uh, Julian believed that the soul in man is the, is the night in him. It is the mysterious psychic darkness. 
It is that which is beyond description and definition. It is this soul that remains more or less suspended, not allowed to manifest itself, locked within the intellectual of the mental faculties. But the mind is not the soul. The mind is subservient to the soul. And the only purpose of mind is to fulfill the search for soul. The mind must die on the threshold of divinity. The mind with its constant conflicts, its various conflicting ideas and attitudes, the points of view which are irreconcilable, and the vast effort to integrate a material existence in a spiritual world. We are coming on to this problem again in our present age. We are seeing the inevitable sorrow of the mind-governed universe. And uh, Julian was aware of this. And while he was part of a mind-governed empire, he realized the basic weakness from which almost all human beings suffer. The effort to create in, a re in an area of illusion that which can only exist in total reality. So in the discussion of the mother of the gods, we find Julian explaining and interpreting to the best of his ability, and his abilities were considerable, the problem of the restoration of grace, the restoration of the soul as the leader of life. As long as the mind governs life, it will lead to a material confusion. And until the confusion is solved by the elevation of the mind above the realm of material pressures, we will never have an enduring culture. So was, uh, Julian wanted the individual to realize that all this vast pageantry which we see around us, this tremendous complication of invention and art and literature and science, industry, law, economics, medicine, all these things belong to the intellectual sphere. And because of that, they are all subject to constant change, and they are subject to eternal emendation. Everything we know demands more study to find out more about it. Every belief we have lingers for a time and is then canceled out by another belief. Every empire we build falls from its own inevitable weakness. Every successful person comes in the end uh, to failure unless he has made the bridge between his life and the eternal life within him. It follows, therefore, that in taking the, uh, Julian's point of view down into our present worldly condition, that he is telling us that there are two kinds of knowledge one that governs the day and the other that governs the night. There are two kinds of lives that we all live, the life of waking and the life of sleep. In the life of waking, our own attitudes govern all things. In the act of sleep, we come back again to the universal law which created us, must dominate us, and must ultimately lead us to redemption. Therefore, sleep becomes a symbol of letting go of fantasy. It is the individual reaching inward to the eternal peace of his own soul. For in the, it is in sleep that the soul is awake, and it is in waking that the soul is mostly asleep. In our daily activities, we depend entirely upon the alertness of the intellect. But in sleep, we depend upon a detachment from the objects of mind and the objects of emotion. If we do not achieve this detachment, we suffer from insomnia, and if it is continued, we suffer from psychological disorders of one kind or another. Therefore, the real life of the person is in sleep. But uh, in order to understand this, we have to also recognize that in, this, in the sleep phenomena as we know it, it is still burdened very heavily by intellection. The individual going to sleep has dreams, and these dreams may often be complicated and difficult. These dreams are not part of the true sleep of the Great Mother. They are parts of a nightmare 
in which the half-awake, half-asleep person struggles with the complications of a mortal existence. They become symbolical of weaknesses and attitudes within the person. Now, as in mysticism, uh, meditation is regarded with great favor, and various exercises of quietude, as in Zen, are cultivated in Oriental peoples. All of these quieting activities, the various beliefs of quietist denominations and sects, all lead to one natural conclusion, namely that quietude and peace is the bridge between the outside and the inside. It is only, as the Chinese said long ago, the sage who sleeps without dreams. Now this sleeping without dreams gradually takes on another phase. This sleep gradually becomes a source not only of the rebuilding of physical life, but of the reorientation of the individual in a universe in which form plays very little part. The uh, internal life of the person, guided by the mystery of the Divine Mother, is led back gradually back to the second birth. In Isis, in Egypt, we have the perfect example of this phenomenon. Isis was not only the mysteries, but Isis was the mother of mysteries. And all of these great institutions of initiation were a part of her life. She, from her womb came the adepts and the masters and the great teachers. She was the mother of all that was good, all that was wise, and all that was inevitable. And also she was the mother of the illumined child Horus, the son of Osiris and Isis, uh, the son of life and light, of light and darkness, of day and night. And uh, Julian, in his essay to the Sovereign Son, devotes considerable space also to this problem. But actually, as has been said in many religions, the human being is subject to a double birth. He is bound physically into the material world by the various laws of nature and the environment in which he finds himself. But he has a second birth into the inner world of life, into the temple, into the mysteries, into the secret parts of the world governed over by the mother of mysteries. Therefore, we may feel at this time that the search for the solution to our present worldly problem, if we acted on the advice of Julian, the, the uh, answer would be, be still and know that I am God. Instead of trying to angle our way in and out of situations, instead of great conflicts and conversations that mean little or nothing, all real solutions come from quietude, from the individual reaching back into his own soul, which is the mother of his life. And each person in their daily existence and their daily experience has need of the comforting power of the world mother. And this mother has not only male and f children, but female children. And all of these children have the same mother. Therefore, all arts and sciences are from the same source. Everything that is good has come from the great mother. Everything that is not good is the result of man trying to separate himself from the inevitable plan to which he belongs. Now the uh, comforting power of truth has been recognized from the beginning and we can come into the spheres of alchemy for transmutation and for all the regenerations of life. We are in an emergency now, a very difficult one, in which we are suddenly discovering to our uh, dismay that intellection is not going to solve our problem. The mind is a servant of bodily needs. The mind is the, is the servant of the excesses which we have cultivated. The mind does everything that it can to support its own mistakes. It tries desperately to maintain its own self-centered, selfish purposes. And this mind is therefore a negative mind. It is a mind of the abyss. It is a false darkness. A darkness arising not from the source of life, but from the source of error. 
and the, we find this picked up later by St. Augustine and a great deal made of it in the early Christian church. But in the, main, in the main problem we have this. We are going to keep on fighting, apparently. We're going to have new laws. We're going to elect new senates, new representatives. We're going to do everything we can to find a solution that will bring peace and happiness without interfering in any way with our own personal right to be wrong. We want to go on doing as we do and have legislation protect us. We are, in a sense, uh, we might say, de infantile uh, delinquents. We are not obeying the parental pattern. And because of our way of living today, we have turned our minds, hearts, and energies away from that pattern. We are trying desperately to evade the pressure of right. We do not care whether we are right or wrong. We are physically tied up in a situation where many people are drinking themselves to death, fully knowing what they're doing, but have so decided. Others are suffering from narcotics addiction. Others are there in all types of crime, including suicide, simply because they are going to do exactly what they intend to do. The, the terror and tragedy of the consequence is around all of us every minute, but the delinquent continues to be delinquent. This is because he does not in his own life have the energies, the powers, or the insights uh, to take care of the precious gifts that the universe has bestowed upon him. He insists on doing it his way. Now in trying to combat this, we have people rising on all sides trying to find answers to these problems. The only answer remains to relax back as far as is humanly possible into the divine plan as it continues throughout all time and all space. We must come back again into the arms of the Great Mother. We must find in the only peace there is in the devotion and dedication to those principles which are immutable, inevitable, and eternal. Thus we can see around us a need today for Julian's point of view. We can see that as a ruler of an empire for only two years before he was killed in battle, uh, Julian was fully aware of the tragedy of the time. He knew also the tragedy of his own life. He believed in reincarnation and believed that in a previous embodiment he had been Alexander the Great. And as both lives were almost parallel, there seemed to be some support to this hypothesis. But Julian was convinced that we live again, and that in reliving we become a little better and a little wiser. For a time again we go to sleep in the Great Mother, the Mother being the silence of, mo of mortal things which permits the, permits the sound of life to be heard. Somewhere behind the confusion is the harmony of the spheres. Somewhere behind all the illegalities with which we are burdened is a simple pattern of universal law, a law that is equal in its love for all that lives, is sustaining all life with a benevolence and abundance which we ignore and forget. And so Julian took it for granted that the best and most advantageous course was to search again within ourselves for the soul which is the source of us. He, uh, he believed that the soul is in each person, that the Great Mother abides in each of us. Man and woman alike has the Great Mother principle within its deepest and most esoteric parts. The Great Mother is therefore the silent sufferer for most of the mistakes that we daily make and which we continue to make regardless of our own opportunities to improve. So Julian cultivated and recommended the cultivation of a retrospective life, a life in which, while the mind is active, it deals with the principles of intelligibles rather than intellectuals. A small child, as we have said, is sometimes born much wiser than when he grows up. We also know that a large part of our uh, so-called growth is in a false direction. 
we are not nearly as real and after we have been educated in material matters we are not nearly as kind as gentle as wise in mysteries as we were as ch when we were children so that the child heart as it has been called is really the soul locked in us it is the soul power that can never speak loudly can never shout or cry can never defend itself by any objective action but which must remain quiet until we caught it by our own integrities but to go back further into ourselves is best in peace and for most persons the best time for this peace is when they approach sleep because in sleep the individual has a certain freedom uh, from the pressures of externals the path upward to the to union with the goddess is still obscure but in sleep we begin to feel something we feel the very great truth that when we stop thinking too hard we become better people we find that by relaxing away from the pressures of the day forgetting for a moment what we owe and who owes us we do gain a certain rest now if the pressure of outside things is so great that it disturbs sleep we will very rapidly pass into a serious condition it is therefore very advisable to watch and guide sleep as the beginning of a religion the religion of rest the re religion not of laziness but a religion of suspending the external and allowing the internal to manifest itself through us to the degree that we depart from fallacy reality has a chance and in reality we have not the intellectuals but the intelligibles now the intelligible intelligibles according to Julian are the immutable principles of life the Platonists have another peculiar doctrine which seems to be strange to us and that is that there is nothing in the universe that is not alive now when we think of lives we think of plants or animals or something of that nature but to the Greeks they included everything summer is, a, is alive winter is alive water fire air are alive the air is alive clouds and storms are not simply masses of, of foam in the sky they are actually parts of living creatures the whole world is made up of life nothing is inorganic completely but every form that exists in nature from a rock up or down has something alive in it there is a life in all of these things and the cultivation of the proper use of these things is indispensable to the preservation of humanity now we are beginning to wonder what is happening to our natural resources we are still find, trying to find a place to dump our garbage this is what is part of what Julian was aiming at namely that everything that exists has use and abuse everything has to be done well or sorrow is inevitable every law has to be kept or the lawbreaker suffers now man-made laws have, have been more or less accepted as substitutes for divine law but they are not substitutes and never can be there would be no need for human laws if divine laws were understood and applied now how are we going to get at these divine laws well Julian being a Platonist and also practicing the Platonic disciplines stated very quietly and others after him that there is a journey a journey in life a pathway that leads from the outer to the inner this pathway twists through a complex structure of beliefs opinions doctrines it also twists through all kinds of living forms energies principles minerals vegetables medical interests and everything everything is part of one great living structure and this living structure is based also upon a simple principle use and survive abuse and die this is the point that uh, Julian tries to make from a philosophic standpoint everything in the universe means something and everything in the universe has to be used as it was ten intended to be used or tragedy will follow 
So ignorance may be therefore considered the absence of the realization that it is necessary to live above a, by a code above that of human society. Human society may carry us part of the way, but our great destiny rests in something beyond this. It rests in our gradual coming into the rules and principles of eternal life. <clears throat> While we have a few years here, we are immortal beings. And as immortal beings, we are faced with an eternity before us. And in this eternity, politics and all the various uh, superficial attitudes of people have very little meaning. By the time we come back, there will be an entirely different human structure, which we will again desperately try to adjust to our own feelings and beliefs. We will try to work out the particular little schemes of ourselves in an environment which is not really, really fit for them. But we will try to keep breaking laws of some kind in order to enjoy what we call freedom. There is no freedom, as also we find in the Platonic Dialogues. There is no fr freedom in the world except that which results from breaking no laws. Freedom is the individual's voluntary adjustment with the purpose for himself, his, cons his acceptance of the reality of his own mission, the realization that he is an embodiment of a divine power. And as long as he lives in harmony with that embodiment, he will be happy. When he goes against the embodiment, he is in much greater trouble than when he goes against man-made statutes. For when he goes against his own inner life, he corrupts that part of himself which is most necessary and most valuable. So under these conditions, we see something of his idea of the world mother. The world mother is this soul that guards everything, guides everything, and actually brings forth from itself all of the deities. It is actually true, as in Egypt, that it is the great mother that brings forth the light of day. For light is a gift of the spirit. Light is something that is necessary to our well-being and therefore being necessary it is available therefore in a, Julian says that the great mother is the mother of light the mother of the gods and the mother of the world now to feel a sense of, um, of the presence of the maternal principle we begin to look into the moral codes of life ideally most of our laws are just but we do not keep them Ideally, the human being is kind, but very often it is profitable to be unkind. Under normal conditions, without pressures, the average person is reasonably content with life. But under artificial pressures, this contentment is disturbed and may, land in, may end in rebellion and revolution. So it is to get again into this principle of life and love. Another attribute of the Divine Mother is beauty. Beauty is harmony. Harmony is peace. Beauty is the natural instinct of the human being to produce from himself beautiful things. This is the negative pole. What he is, want, what is wanted is that he will produce from himself a beautiful self, his own. Beauty is a, an, an element, a being, a goddess, and all ancient peoples believed these principles were deities or semi-deities. So beauty becomes an aspect of the power of the Great Mother. And uh, a good example of that was perhaps uh, found in the story of the Crusades. During the Middle Ages, there was a great religious upheaval in effort to bring the Holy Sepulchre back into the domain of Christendom. Several Crusades were launched to accomplish this. All failed. And the most terrible, perhaps, of all was the child's crusade when small children went into the desert to die of uh, starvation and just an inability to survive. But when these uh, <coughs> crusades got underway, 
the knights and the princes and the earls and the dukes and all the petty monarchs with their retainers and all their officers got together and made a great military body uh, to lead uh, the way of the resurrection or restoration of the Holy Sepulchre. They went out and they fought for years. And most of them died out there. Some came back. But there was a very heavy mortality. In the meantime, what happened at home? The ladies took over the management of the castles. They took over the ways and works of their husbands who were away and may never come back. They found that it was impossible to take care of all the duties of management except for one thing. It was noticeable among these people that most of these ladies were tired of castles filled with armament in which the pr practically the only relaxation was fighting. They felt that it was time to make things a little more homelike. And believe it or not, they did it. And if, while their husbands were away, they brought in tapestries, beautiful carpets, paintings, objects of art, grace, all kinds of activities, uh, dancing, music, uh, theater, all these things came while hubbies were away from home. <laughs> and from that time on, home was no longer a, a kind of dungeon. It became a place of pleasure and pleasantness. It became a place where people could dream pleasant dreams, uh, to take pleasant activities, develop hidden talents, and become more sociable and likable and take far better and more conscious care of their children. So from that time on, woman's place in the advancement of civilization became permanent because to her was entrusted a number of values, one of which was beauty, one of which was a desire to make things more lovely, to grow gardens, to do all kinds of things that make the earth, the earth more pleasant to live in. Well, this type of beauty, involving soul beauty, psychic beauty, also became part of the new order of life, which was seeking to find soul within body. Beauty was a manifestation of soul, not its full manifestation, but it was a release of something that was in there that had been locked in there for thousands of years through the mistakes and misfortunes of human society. So now beauty came forth as a modifying, modernizing factor. But beauty soon got mixed up with the material objectives. And the first thing you know, art became overly expensive, much of it very decadent and uninspiring. And the great gift of beauty, which we find in the classic works of the antiquity, both East and West, gradually died out because people didn't protect it they didn't recognize beauty as a soul power they gradually reduced it to a merchandise and this was a very serious and great mistake against the growth of human beings but beauty was there in spite of all this and beauty was part of soul and beauty was a transforming transmuting agent that changed material things that were rather crude and objectionable into something acceptable and in many cases truly grand. We find this especially in religion where the great cathedrals and churches came into existence where the various rites and rituals of religion were glorified and made beautiful and wonderful. But as time went on, this beauty, these achievements were not enough. We found the individual falling back into another trap the trap of the constant pressure of material purpose. They say, and probably it is true, that the great cause of this, of course, is that no average person is aware of the continuity of his own existence. He has to take immortality on faith. But a quick job on the business level is very factual here and now. It is one thing to make a million here, and another to hope for grace in the life to come. And too many people have no imagination in these matters. They do not realize the inevitable transition that must come. They do not realize that they are capable, if they have the insight and the understanding, of moving tranquilly from one life to the other. 
but even with the best of those who are now struggling for enlightenment, the pressure of the mortal mind, so to say, is too strong. Things become matters of suffering in terms of material value. And behind all of this is the quiet, gentle, gracious radiance of the mother of mysteries, the soul. Now, the, there are various answers to what is soul. This is one of the things that has been much debated. Uh, Julian was of the opinion that the soul being a, a phase or manifestation of night, that, fo that soul was the absolute existence itself. Soul was the eternal, in in unchangeable, immutable, inevitable reality. Soul was infinite good, cap capable of appearing in an infinite uh, group of manifestations of good. Soul was reality. All the rest is in some ways strangely, vaguely unreal. And that which we call unreal is the great reality. And then this, uh, Julian gives us some other interesting thoughts. As the one eternal reality, and being, as so to say, in every individual, the living spirit of himself, the unchangeable life of his own spirit, this being true, the person in his daily life is living out of a reservoir of soul energy. Behind every anger is peace. Behind every uncouth word is gentleness. Somewhere behind all of the confusion of mortal existence is the immutable, inevitable fact of infinite love. So now love comes in. The soul loves. The soul is the instrument of love in all things. And the soul of its own nature waiting patiently imprisoned within this fantastic constitution of living creatures. The soul is infinite love in infinite manifestation. In other words, Julian would have said that, that sleep or night or darkness is actually absolute love. It is that which is behind everything. It is that which moves every reality, every legal, lawful move in the unfoldment of human destiny is motivated by love. All of the crimes have been built of hate, indifference, selfishness, stupidity, and things of this nature. But all the great good things have come from love. And those whom we most remember as the great teachers of our race were those who so loved their humanity that they gave their life to the service of it. Love, therefore, is another aspect of the mother of mysteries. Now, love is a strange thing because it is not what we ordinarily call love. It is not a physical thing. Love can manifest under certain conditions physically, and a manifestation of its physical reality is also very noble and important. But love in turn of the infinite is this love of life for life, reality for reality, eternity for eternity. It is something that is there always. And we ascend the ladder of love as we ascend the ladder of the sciences, step by step. We, as uh, Plotinus tells us, there are several degrees of love. There are loves that are selfish, loves that are unselfish. But the greatest of all love is the love of God and the love of truth. Things that we are forgetting today. We are forgetting to maintain the gentle, simple sincerity of our inward lives. We become hysterical, we become nervous, defeated, anxious, and too opinionated. We are critical and we gossip and we uh, work all kinds of schemes on each other and exploit one another to the end of time. But behind it all, just as behind life is purpose, so behind all human emotions is the cultivation of divine love, the love by means of which 
the individual sacrifices all else for the fulfillment of the divine destiny for which he was intended. So there are two persons locked within us. One, as Goethe says in Faust, to the earth's aspires, and the other to the heavens aspires. And this is our problem. We are locked in conflict between two standards of life. A miserable standard that we have made for ourselves and can no longer endure. And a divine standard which is available if we will learn it, reveal it, or, less, or let it manifest through us. So the problem we have now in the 20th century is which way are we going to turn the energies and powers which we have? Are we going to follow those who go into tyrannies of one kind and another and try to create a reform by killing half the population? This is simply an, a desperate effort not to achieve a reform, but to achieve a maintenance and continuance of what we desire to do. Everywhere where it hurts, we are wrong. But we do not know how to be right without sacrificing the smaller part of ourselves. Well, as we go along through life, we find the smaller parts hardly worth saving anyway. That part which is important is the dream, the hope, the faith, all of these attributes which uh, Julian attributes to the deities. It is only when we form a kind of partnership with the divine that life begins to smooth out and we begin to know where we're going. So we have a big job on our hands because in the last 10,000 years we've made a series of very unpleasant mistakes. And if we do not do something about them, we will be in more trouble. But in the last two or three years, perhaps the last five to be more inclusive, there has been a gradual realization among nearly all human beings that we are in trouble. And more, furthermore, that we are the cause of our own trouble. Every day now come the deluges of reports, the evidences of chicanery in every act of business and life. We read of nothing but mistakes and tragic tragedies and deceptions. It is gradually coming home that this thing which we built ourselves, this car of juggernaut which is rolling over all of us, is something that is not even real. We are not being attacked by a mass of facts. We are being attacked by a mass of delusions, by strange feelings that are not redeemed. Education is not teaching us the things we need to know. We are mistaking the good life. The good life to us is another yacht. But with the yacht we get more trouble than we had before. Everything that we do that is contrary to law causes us more unhappiness ultimately. So our present course is a very wise, long-range and careful construction of misery. We are doing all we can to do it wrong. Now, this is not at all necessary, but we do not know which way to turn. Uh, various religious leaders are not in particularly good condition at the moment either. There are all kinds of trouble. In, where, in what direction can we turn for truth? Uh, Julian answered, turn inside. Go into yourself. Now, a lot of people will go into themselves probably and be rather disappointed. The inside will not be as attractive as they hoped it was going to be. It's going to be more like a, a neglected house with all its parts falling to pieces. But it's still the only road. We have to go in far enough to touch reality in ourselves. There is no other place where we can reach out and touch it. We can't touch it with any sensory perception. All we can see is shadows. We cannot touch it with books or laws. We can only gain from these encouragement, inspiration, and some consolation in the search for what we need. Yet we must find it. And the great problem of today is to find ways to get deeply enough into ourselves to find in ourselves the peace of the Great Mother. The Mother of Mysteries, the Virgin of the World. This particular concept is an internal value. Christians speak of Christ in them as the hope of glory. 
it is certainly also true that all of the divine parts of life are within us. Every good thing has a polarity in our natures. In us is hope, faith, peace, love, and charity. These are all inside. And no matter how hard we try, we can never find on the outside a substitute for these moods and modes within our own natures. We have to find the good that has been there since the beginning. We must find the peace that comes from sharing our lives with the infinite purpose of divinity. Yet not knowing just how to proceed in this matter, there are ways in which we can try to gain a little more insight. First of all, with our objective faculties, we can come to one important negative conclusion. The way it is now is wrong. This we are not going to be able to debate very successfully. It is wrong, we know it's wrong, we wonder what we're going to do about it. So, knowing that it is wrong, we must do what we can to change it. Knowing that it is wrong, we know, so also know that it is possible to compound the felony. We can continue to do the thing wrong, and because it hurts a little more as we do it, we will continue until we reach a state of agony. We are not uh, going to solve any problem by the use of methods that have failed since the dawn of time. We will never find peace in hate. We will never find peace in war. We will never find peace of mind and internal happiness in lives cluttered with a variety of self-pities and jealousies and ignoble actions. The Greeks had good deities and the Babylonians and Chaldeans had what they call the daemons. A daemon was not a demon, that was a later invention. A daemon was a spirit. It was a spirit, a good spirit that came to each person at birth and remained with him all his life. And when he died, the daemon led him into the afterlife. Well, this daemon was a kind of a familiar spirit. It is very much what has been perpetuated in the Catholic Church as the guardian angel. It is a sort of a friendly spirit that protects us and does for us things that it can to make life better. Now, to, find, to discover the guardian angel, we have to begin... Uh, to be kind to it. We have to be kind to principles. We have to be appreciative when good things happen. We, ha we should try it in every way possible to take advantage of opportunities to be of service and of value to each other. All this is a beginning, but it is an end to one thing, namely that we will learn that we cannot talk ourselves into a state of grace. We cannot legislate the world into peace. We have got to discover a level within consciousness itself which is peace and transform our world into that level. We are on a great ascending arc. We have to go up a step in order to get out of what we're in now. To go up a step, we must be a step better than we are now or we'll never make the step. If, if, however, there's always this other answer. Nature is not destructive. Nature has no intentions of destroying us or allowing us to destroy ourselves. But nature is perfectly aware that when we are wrong, we must suffer in order to learn why we are wrong. If we break rules, we must suffer from having broken those rules. But it's not necessary to break the same rules every day. We do not have to do the same things all the time. Now today we have another problem that is considerably worrying many people, and that is the strange attitudes that some religious groups are taking. Religion is being, to a certain measure at least, exploited, and to this also we find difficulty. Religion belongs to God. Religion is the blessed mother of life. It is all things that are necessary. Religions do not have to be all alike on the surface, but they are all alike in substance and essence. Therefore, religion is a way to light, 
and if this is exploited it is another very serious disaster in human affairs we are doomed to find trouble as long as we have ulterior motives and these at the present time seem to dominate most of humanity so we have all these different problems to work with as we try to clear ourselves of the problems and the miseries that we face today we have the strength to do right we always have the strength but we have so impoverished our own self-confidence that we no longer believe in ourselves we no longer believe in the things we are trying to do we have reduced reduced life to a problem of work and vacation and that's all so now we have to rebuild this whole thing every individual is important every person carries within its, its himself or herself this spark of the divine the world mother is in all of our hearts it is in all of our uh, instinctive inevitable reactions to suffering when we see suffering we are moved something happens and when great problems arise we feel a deep sense of participation in the world's uh, tragedy so this all these deep inner feelings must come out they must come out to the surface where we can work with them there is no need in this world for hunger there is no need in this world for the devastations of war and politics these are all uh, due to a strange kind of negation which is partly mental and partly physical but no part of it is spiritual or belongs to the powers of the soul the soul is the eternal peacemaker and there is a kind of mysticism which we have to understand this mysticism was very strongly taught in Alexandria the great city that was the mother of mysteries and also the seat of the worship of the great goddess Isis here there was a distinct realization that just as long as the world is as it is humanity commonly considered and together will not be immediately or instantly transformed but more and more will come to the little door that leads out of the present problem into the beginnings of ultimate solution in Egypt these door, this door was the mysteries and in almost every religion has a mystical content somewhere in it the Sufis of Islam the Zen of Buddhism all of these are mystical groups beneath the surface of a religion seeking to understand more about the great mystery of life all of religion to points toward the victory of the soul over circumstance but we do not as yet fully understand or recognize the procedure so today we also have mystical groups seeking to go deeper seeking to find the solutions to things but in order to achieve this the individual must make certain adjustments in his own life first he cannot take a great burden of mistakes into a mystical setting and believe that he can put his burdens all on the Lord or something of this nature we are the great principles of life are not burden bearers they are those that remove all burden so we have to begin to find ways to bring individuals into greater enlightenment we have to find ways in which average persons take resolution to do better to become more involved in the great mysteries of divine regeneration and we know that uh, in the beginning of the 17th century the uh, mystics got together in Europe and created a universal reformation this universal reformation is, is part of a plan it is part of a realization that the time was at hand for the revealing of the mystery of the transmutation of life that the time was here in which there must be a major step forward in the history of humanity in order to be able to accept and discipline the various mass manifestations that have developed there has to be a higher integrity while we were all farmers it was different 
Well, we went out in the morning and plowed and came home tired at the end of the day. It was different. But now we live in a, a very complicated system, getting worse every day with eternal temptations to the abuse of power. In everything we think of and everything we do, we're seeking advantage for ourselves at the expense of others. This tremendous piling up of discoveries, inventions, formulas, patterns, codes, and systems is bringing us to this edge of spiritual bankruptcy. The only way to escape it is not to try, as some have done, to break it down with bombs or something of that nature, but to realize that the only solution to it is to advise and invite individuals to sink, sink, seek deeper within themselves, to find greater values in themselves, and to realize that there is an answer. Now, as it is now, more people are beginning to realize that there are answers. We are coming to the point where it is obvious that we have exhausted the ability to make mistakes with impunity. We've come now to the point where we must suffer from our mistakes. And in order to do this, we must also learn something. To help us to gain or regain peace of mind, to regain in the home, to build honest friendships, to do those things which are the common good and beauty of mankind, we have got to get together and work out the solutions. If we don't, we will continue in this strange and mysterious uh, difficulty. We will discover that the human body also is involved in this. The pressures and conflicts of the mind and emotions are endangering the outlook of people as to daily matters. In other words, our imaginations are becoming sick. They are sick because we are corrupting them. And because of this, again, we are losing a valuable factor or faculty to help us to do the things we want to do. So we might take for a few minutes then a view of the Neoplatonic tradition and the Platonic tradition of Proclus of Athens, which were behind Julian in his concept of life. Plotinus was probably the greatest mystic of the ancient world. He was a person of incredible uh, integrities. He was very wise in many things, but wisdom was not his course. It was not wisdom that he was cultivating. He was cultivating the arbitration of all differences of human minds and thoughts. He wanted us to realize that we will never be happy in this world until we stop thinking how important we are and begin to earn importance by our own codes of action. To Plotinus, religion was service. It was the giving of self to neighbor and to God. It was constant consideration for the sufferings of others, a constant willingness to modify our own courses of action and by accomplishing this way the common good. Now Plotinus pointed out that it begins with individuals. There is a person here who becomes less selfish. There is a person somewhere else who learns to control emotions and temper. There is another reformed rascal of some kind who has discovered the importance of virtue. Little by little all over the world these groups are increasing and they are today very definitely. Little by little we are losing the interest we once had in our own personal achievements at the expense of everyone else. So Plotinus said there is only one journey, and that is the journey inward. There is only one truth, and that is in the soul, and the soul is at the apex of our own existence. Therefore, to sit back quietly and cultivate the powers of the soul will give us the strength and the courage to do the things that are necessary. And what are the powers of the soul? The powers of the soul are to see good and to serve good. The powers of the soul are to turn against corruption. Powers of the soul are to seek peace in ourselves and moderation in our own conduct. By degrees, the individual can relax away from the pressures of the day and find instead the peace that surpasseth understanding. To Plotinus, therefore, 
the rule was very simple if he was a father a husband and a citizen he believed in his home and protected it he had no shallow or false beliefs over influenced by the fallacies around him he lived as he should have lived he was so respected by the Romans when he was in Rome that he, they made him mentor of their children <laughs> and many noble families used him to de perpetuate their, with the will of their states <clears throat> he was able to become a tremendous citizen teaching the children to respect their parents teaching the parents to respect their children teaching everywhere by example a quiet life peacefully lived without delusions of grandeur and gradual freedom from the great impulses of mistake from which we all suffer Plotinus was fully aware that wealth must go <clears throat> you can never solve our problems on the level of wealth he knew that all ambitions that were inordinate must grow there is only one ambition that can live and that is the ambition to find our way home again to the divine power until these things become available to us we must try every day to call upon the soul for assistance when we are not quite sure of a decision keep quiet for a minute and ask inwardly what the decision should be and after a while you may note that some very good advice comes from the soul though it may not agree with the will of your mind it is good however to give the soul a chance to give it the opportunity to direct life wherever possible the more opportunities you afford it the more times you give it leadership the better a person <coughs> you will be and so it goes through the whole gamut and above it all is the mother of mysteries the mother waiting for her children to come home waiting for the children she bore to honor and protect each other and also waiting for the fulfillment of the great mystery of life namely that we shall all become part of a great maternal paternal hierarchy of divine beings who must be the lords and masters of creation every creation has to be created by those who have found the heart of things because everything that lives must live because of the laws of life and the laws of life are the very things that we are breaking today now just a little quiet sympathy about it won't change the course of history but if we do decide in our own way to be a little more thoughtful a little more kind a little more generous a little more tolerant uh, we will find gradually a new tranquility comes into ourselves I know a case quite recently of a very bad case of hysteria. It was under treatment for a long time, <clears throat> and at the end of the long treatment, it was still very difficult, because this hysterical person was clinging desperately to an unfortunate past. They had never gotten over the sufferings they believed were unfair. Yet anyone with any perspective could see that they had caused their own trouble but they couldn't understand it because all they could do was remember what they had suffered and they were very unhappy but finally they got hold of a an idea <clears throat> that came from a mystical group of the importance of blessing blessing disaster every time something hurts say god bless you it was a funny little thing to do but every time it happened it seemed to transform a hate into an acceptance and in a few months the lady got over her trouble but she had to first of all recover from the from maintaining a destructive attitude the one thing that locks us away from the virgin of the world within ourselves are locked attitudes attitudes that we can't change because we have lived with them too long almost everyone has damaged their lives in some way by fixations of attitude there is no need for them fixations are on a lower level if we transform that level if we rise above it 
if we achieve a significance greater, this fixed attitude fades away. And most fixed attitudes lie on misrepresentations or wrong uh, interpretations of circumstances. There is no need for them. And we have to outgrow them. Now if we're coming into an age of matriarchal leadership in which women are going to become tremendously important in this life of our humanity, let us not well, permit them or let us pray that they will not fail in one of the great uh, dangers that is presenting itself. A woman like Isis, uh, like the mother of the gods, is a soul being. Man is a soul being also, but her soul is peculiarly developing sense of value and arbitration of difficulties. The soul of woman is a redeeming soul, a soul of love and tenderness and compassion, integrity, value, protection. The average woman is the embodiment of protection. This is her natural instinct from the soul power locked within her. She is dominantly the mother of mysteries. And it is hoped beyond all possible hope that in this case, in our present case, she will not become too involved in the existing patterns that are wrong, but will with true dedication and understanding and insight will help to restore the link between the mind and the soul. If this link to the soul is achieved, the mind will then function properly. And the link to the soul by which the mind can accomplish this is through love, graciousness, kindness, understanding, compassion, and the gradual expansion of the mother-soul concept until it embraces all life, all need, and all problem. This is what is really necessary at the moment. We have souls locked in us for centuries. Incarnation after incarnation, we have not been able to free ourselves from the lock we have placed upon our own consciousness. This lock must be unlocked. The gates must be opened. And the great flood of love, which is built into our archetype, must be allowed to come through and dominate and affect us in a proper manner. It is therefore a great deal to say that we must begin to build not a woman's world, but a soul world, with her guidance and with the constant cooperation of all who understand the truths of life. It is now time for the laws to give place to love. And as long as law is not one with love, there will be tyranny. But law and love, working together, can fulfill the mission of the ages. So let the man be as virtuous as he can. Let the woman love with the soul power that is locked within herself. And this soul power will never be perverted, never be abused, or never be misused, because the mind power has been averted. The mind power has been misused. But above the mind, ruling the mind and dominant over the mind is the soul. And while the soul is good, the world will live. And the soul cannot sicken, but it can be locked long time, for a long time, before it can come through. The victory of soul over circumstance is inevitable. It just that we put off the good times by unnecessary conflicts within our own nature. Let's try to work to bring the good, the lovely, the loved, the beautiful, and the mother of mysteries more closely into our daily lives. Thank you.